Welcome to the Faith Bible Church Podcast. We hope the message you're about to hear is a blessing in your growth in Jesus Christ. We also pray that the message is not a substitute for your critical place in the local church and in community. Thanks again for joining us. It's something that we think about a lot. We, uh, we use the word, oh, 30, 40, 50 times a day. It's, uh, it's part of how God hardwired us. We think about it when we go to bed at night. Certainly in the morning when we get up, we're, we're thinking about this word. This word may not be exactly spoken as we wor- wake up, but it's, th- the concept is there. It, it's something that we're, we're thinking about that, that's in our brains. And we certainly use the word a, a great deal. The word is hope. I hope we make it on time. I hope that, <laughs> fill in the blank there. How many times did you use that? How many times did I use it this morning? Uh, I hope that herd of deer with the buck in the middle of it doesn't think I'm another doe and come chasing me. I hope, I hope, uh, I hope that uh, there's not traffic as I go to work. I mean, we, we use that word hope all the time. This morning, I want us to think about that in biblical terms. I want you to open your Bibles to Psalm 130. So get your Bibles and open to Psalm 130. We're going to be looking at Psalm 130 and Psalm 131. So get those Bibles open. It's very important that you have the Bible open in front of you because what's important is what God has said, uh, not so much what I'm going to say, but what God says. Now, what I'm going to say hopefully will be interesting and be able to follow along and all those kinds of things. But, but this is what is inerrant. This is what is really from God. So I want you to see it for yourself. And so if you get your iPhone out or something like that, now don't do like I did the other morning in the men's group. I was there and the speaker mentioned a scripture and I wanted to look it up. Didn't have my Bible with me, so I pulled my cell phone out and I was getting it going there. And then I punched read and it started reading it out loud and then I'm you know trying to get the thing off kind of thing I got it off and then I punched something again it started reading again finally got the thing off and you know put it away kind of thing you want to throw it away it's something like that you can't do any rate uh just be sure you're not read having it read out loud kind of thing uh but Psalm 130 have that open for you in front of you it would be very very good to 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 see it for yourself not just to hear it so let me give you a, a brief idea of how this psalm or this poem is structured because there's a, a purposeful, meaningful structure here that, that'll help us understand what God is saying here. The first two verses gives us the setting, the reason that he needs hope. He's going to talk about being in depths of the despair kind of thing and, and really needing hope. So the first couple of verses, one and two, that's the need for hope, you might say. And then verses three and four give us a universal, eternal hope. An area of life where everybody struggles, but also an area of life where the hope is offered to us. So an eternal hope in three and four, talking about forgiveness. We'll get into that in a moment. And then in five and six, we have a definition of hope. And it's almost like he talks about one eternal hope. Then he's going to talk about the definition of hope. And then in the next few verses, after three and four, down in the next, let me get the numbers here right. Uh, yeah, verses seven and eight, or excuse me, I'm, I'm giving the numbers wrong here. Let me back up. One and two is the need for hope. Three and four is the first eternal hope we're going to look at. Five and six is the definition of hope. And then seven and eight is a second universal eternal hope kind of thing. And then in Psalm 131, it's very interesting. Look at the end of it. Verse three, hope in the Lord. That ties it together with Psalm 130. In Psalm 131, it's like, okay, we've talked about eternal hope. Wonderful. Now let's talk about daily hope. What does that look like on a daily basis? So that's how these two Psalms fit together. And that's kind of the structure of what we're going to be looking at. So let's look at verses one and two more closely. Out of the depths, I cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Well, you can just hear 
the hopelessness in his voice there. Oh, God, I need you. Out of the depths. It's like he's in a pit. He's like, oh, God, I've got this hopeless situation. I don't know what I'm going to do. God, I'm crying out to you. Hear my supplications. Now, there's various levels of hopelessness and various kinds of hopelessness. In a sense, various kinds of pits that we find ourselves in the depths of. It might be that you would say something like this, you know, God, I, I just am afraid. I just am afraid of where our nation is going and how things are going out there. It just seems like every time I turn around, there's this another, another problem, another difficulty, like the thing at Astral World, God. It, why did that happen? How can we have a culture that lets stuff like that happen? That just doesn't make any sense to me, God. Where in the world is our nation going? It seems like every day our morals slip more and more and more. And what used to be right and wrong is now or wrong used to be is now accepted as right. God, it, I, God, I'm just frankly afraid of where this nation, where our culture is going. And there's this, not just a general feeling of hopelessness, but you you sense it very real in your life. And you're fearful for your kids, for your grandkids, for yourself. And there's this feeling of hopelessness because you're afraid. Maybe your feeling of hopelessness, maybe your, your, your sense of being in the depths of despair as this man is, is not so much afraid of the future, but just frankly... Could we say bored with the present? Not in the sense that you're hopeless because you're bored, but in the sense that there's this feeling of nothing's going to really change. My marriage is just kind of mediocre. In fact, if people really knew what was going on inside of my marriage, I'd be, be amazed at how the fact that we, we stay together. But there's really no hope there. It's just boring. It's, there's no life to it. My job is a boring end. There's just no meaningfulness there. And, and, just, and it's just, I, I, I kind of feel hopeless. And it may not be this, this despair of God, I'm going to die kind of feel, but it's just, it's just, God, this is, is this what life is going to be, God? I just feel hopeless, God. Maybe it's because you were trying to figure out what in the world am I going to be doing with my life? And God, I'm trying to make decisions, but I can't make decisions. For my, I, God, help me with that. I, I just am struggling with a, a sense of hopelessness about where am I going in life and what my, is my life going to amount to? God, how do I figure this out? It may be something major like that, but you know, but sometimes, sometimes the depths of despair are far more uh, mundane you worried about Thanksgiving and who's coming over and what the family's going to be like when they get there? Yeah. You bought that new couch and you're scared to death that Aunt Susie's going to come in. The first thing she's going to say is, where did you get that? Yeah. All kinds of different levels and different kinds of hopelessness. But I think all of us, when we hear, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ear be attentive to the voice of my son. I think we can all say, yes, God, there's a part of me that's hopeless, and I need your hope. And so God says, okay, let's talk about some areas that I've given you hope in. Look at verse 3. Here's this first eternal hope he's going to talk about. If you, O oh Lord, should mark iniquities, O oh Lord, who could stand? Oh, now that's a, let's, let's think about that a little more deeply here. If you, O Lord, would mark iniquities, think about it in these terms, that, that God is marking down when you sin, okay? Now, all right, not just today, but all your life. from the very time that you could figure out what was right and wrong and you started sinning and we all have. Think about all the actions that God would have marked down. Hitting your brother or hitting your sister or uh, uh, you know, doing something wrong at school that you knew was wrong and then on and, and on and on and then teenage years and oh man, this, oh, ooh, I don't even want to think about those years, God. And then uh, when you, you, you stole something at work and no one found out, and they still hadn't found out, and boy, it's on and on and on, mark, 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 mark. 
And then God says, yeah, well, th- that's, that's your actions, but let's, let's talk about also your words. Let's mark those down. The words that you said that were wrong, the lies that you told to make yourself seem like you're a little better than you are, the, uh, the way that you said those angry things to your spouse and no one else knows except they do, but you know that you said that and you can never take, and, and that, those words and those words. Oh, and then God says, oh, by the way, I, I'm, I'm God. And because I'm God, I not only can see your actions, I not only can see your words, but I can, I can see and I know your thoughts. The list goes on. Who can stand before God with all that? Well, well, look at the second part of the verse or the next verse. Oh, Lord, who can stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Oh God, thank you for that forgiveness. We've been singing about it, that Jesus Christ came to pay the price for our sins. Now, the Old Testament folks, when they read this, when they were first singing this, because this was a song, they didn't fully understand it. They knew that somehow God would provide a sacrifice to give them forgiveness. They didn't know how it was gonna happen. They just somehow had faith that it would happen. We know how it's happened. Christ died in my place on the cross to pay for my sins. All those marks that are on my account, when Jesus died, they were taken away. They were taken away. I don't have to pay for those. So there's forgiveness. This is the first eternal hope that he speaks of. Some time ago, uh, you know, I had a tooth start acting up and went to the dentist and he went, well, let's try this. And he tried that and it helped a little bit, but the day went by and it started hurting again. So I go to him again and about the third visit to the dentist and he's tried all these different things and he's going, you know, Calvin, only one thing to do here, root canal. Ugh. Okay, Lord, here we go. So go to the specialist and I'm just going, Lord, I, I, not only do I not want a root canal, I can't afford a root canal right now. I had been done, doing some ministry stuff that I thought was going to be compensated and it wasn't. So that was a big chunk of money that I had to put out of my pocket that wasn't going to come back. Lord, I, I, I can't afford this another you know, big expense here. Lord, what's, okay, but I have to do it. You know, man, tooth is hurting. We got to fix this thing. So I went to the, the, uh, the guy that does that. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but uh, uh, the... No, it doesn't matter. A dentist, especially a dentist. And, uh, you know, go through the whole routine, you know, hour, hour and a half, maybe or so in the, the chair and it gets all done kind of thing. And then comes the real painful part, you know, pulling out the credit card. Sit down there, standing there at the receptionist's desk about to get the credit card and get going. And uh, she looks up and says, it's no charge. <laughs> what do you mean no charge? He didn't do a good job or something or other? You know, what's, what's going on here? I mean, the, she had no charge. But I said, no, no, I need to pay you. She said, no, someone paid it for you. I, I was shocked. I mean, I actually had to sit down in a chair. I was so overwhelmed. You, really? I, I'm, I'm forgiven of my debt? Yes. I, I, I was just flabbergasted. I couldn't believe it. I think the dentist paid it for me. I don't know. Maybe somebody else did, but I think he did. But that feeling of, I don't have to pay for it. That's what God is telling us here. But with you, there is forgiveness. Yes, all those marks were there, but it's forgiven. And notice what he says right after that, end of verse 4, that you may be feared. I had an interesting reaction when I found out that the dentist had paid my debt. He gave me a list of instructions, by the way, for me to follow to take care of this thing. You know what I did? I went, uh, he doesn't know what he's doing. I'm not going to do any of that. No. I took that and said, hey, this guy cares about me. I'm going to do exactly what he says here. See, that's how it should be with us and God. When we sense that we have been forgiven, we should fear him. Yes, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll be happy to do it. Your word gives me all kinds of instructions, so let me follow it. Let me find out what is here, and let let me live accordingly. The forgiveness should lead to fear, which means obedience, joyful obedience. Why would we not do what God wants us to do? Of course we will. So that eternal hope of forgiveness, you know, most of us don't really struggle with that. Oh, we might at times. But by and large, when we sang those songs about being forgiven and all kind of stuff like that, man, emotions swelled up in you. Yes, Lord, thank you for that. 
Thank you for that forgiveness. Thank you for the hope that I have been forgiven. Well, if we believe that, and if we have hope for that, it should affect how we daily have hope. We'll see how it does in a few minutes. But now the psalmist kind of stops and says, I want to stop talking about the eternal hope of forgiveness, and now I want to talk to you about what exactly is hope. Let's, let's define it. Let's get a picture of it. So look at the next couple of verses here. Verse 5, 6. I wait for the Lord. My soul does wait. Now already we're getting the idea here. We've got this word wait coming in, not just hope, but wait. And in his word do I hope. Okay, Lord, you're talking about waiting and you're talking about hoping. Those two things kind of go together. And in the Hebrew language, those two different words are used, but the words are are almost interchangeable. It's waiting on God to do something. It's hoping that God will do something. And I'm still a little bit confused, God. Could you give me a picture? Could you give me something, some kind of image to be able to nail down exactly what you mean by hope? And he says, yep, let me give you one here. And he does. Middle of verse 6. My soul waits for the Lord. Now, here it is. More than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. Now, think about it in terms of a scale of hope. Okay? There's sometimes when we use these words hope and wait, and, and we. It, it's real mercurial. It's real maybe, maybe not kind of thing. It's kind of like you're going to say, I hope the Texans win. Okay, not much hope that they're going to, but I, I hope they will win, okay? That's kind of a, a, a you know, football Texan hope kind of thing. But then we kind of move on the spectrum a little bit, and we say, you know, back when baseball season was going, I hope the Astros will win. Hey, there's, you know, a better chance that they're going to win. Now, you know, they didn't win the big one, but they got pretty close. So I, I hope that the Astros will win, a little different hope. But, but that's, not, that's not the kind of hope that the watchman has. The watchman is over here, way over here, very different from just kind of a mercurial, maybe, maybe not, maybe it's going to happen, maybe not. Over here, he's watching for the sun to come up. (laughs) That's very different to hoping for the sun to come up than for hoping a team will win. Is the sun going to come up? You bet it's going to. It's not a question of maybe it will, maybe it won't. It's a question of I'm just waiting for it to happen. I'm just hoping in the sense of a biblical hope that it will come up. And that's what God is saying to us. He's saying that's the kind of hope I want you to have, a hope that I will work. Now, I'm not not necessarily saying I'm going to work in the way that you want me to work. It's not hoping that God will do what I want him to do, but it's a hope that God will work. You know, sometimes the sun comes up just beautifully you know there's some kind of horizon you're looking at maybe it's an ocean or maybe some mountains or something or other and it begins to get brighter and and a little bit brighter and then you see this little bit of a orange kind of thing pop up and you go what is oh that's the sun boy and then it just comes up so fast right there at the horizon at least it seems like it does and there's just you see it come up and it gets light it's beautiful sometimes God's work is that way we see it We can see his hand. Boy, there it is. Yep, got it. I can see what God's doing. But sometimes the sun comes up when it's foggy. And you can't say, oh, I see the sun coming up right there. But you know it's come up. You know it's light. And sometimes we wait on God in that way. Sometimes it's crystal clear what he's going to do. Sometimes it's crystal clear how he's working. But sometimes it's kind of a fog. But we still know he's working. That's the, that's the kind of hope God wants us to have. Not this, well, maybe God's going to do something, maybe he's not. No, no, it's as sure as the sun's going to come up, God's going to work. And I'm going to trust him that he is. Now, that's what biblical hope is. Now, come back to a second, eternal hope. Verses 7 and 8. Oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is loving kindness. Oh, thank you, Lord, for that. That faithful, steadfast love of his. His loving kindness. And with him is abundant redemption. 
He will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. The redemption is not just forgiveness. That's the the first eternal hope we looked at. But redemption is God not only forgiving us, but giving us something better and new and stronger and redeemed. In the New Testament, it speaks about a couple of different redemptions. One, the earth being redeemed. Oh, Lord, thank you for that, that somehow you're going to do that. And man, what a mystery how he's going to do that. I don't know, but but the scriptures say he's going to do that. In Romans chapter 8, some beautiful things about that. But also in Romans chapter 8, it talks about us being adopted and our bodies being redeemed. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about... uh, We've got seeds now, but then we're going to have a full-grown plant. Oh, that wonderful promise of eternal life. Eternal life. No vaccinations needed. No masks needed. No pain like we understand pain today. No, No death. No, oh, a redeemed body. I'm going to get to throw away these glasses. <laughs> oh, I, I look forward, and, and God's going to do that. That's what, that's what he says he's going to do, and that's the redemption he's talking about here, taking something that, that's it's troubled and, and struggling and get, making something beautiful out of it. That's what he's going to do. That's what heaven's all about, and we sing about it. We've sung about it. And most of us say, yeah, I know that day's coming. And we believe that, and we have hope in that. And we don't struggle with that so much. Oh, we may struggle, we certainly struggle with, hey, Lord, how come it hasn't come yet? How come I have to struggle here? But, oh, God, thank you for that day when, it, when it's, it's going to be right and beautiful and wonderful, and I'm going to have an eternal body that's going to be so much better and different. Thank you for that day. And we believe that, and we have hope in that, and, 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 and it's real hope. And God says, yeah, but I want that eternal hope to translate into daily hope. So what's that look like? That's where Psalm 131 comes into play. So look at that with me. It's almost as if it's the the third stanza or the fourth stanza to this this song that they're singing here. But let's look at what he says. Oh Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, eyes are not lifted up, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me, nor do I walk in these things that I just can't figure out. I don't exercise my life there. I don't live there. I know they're there. I'm going to try to figure them out as best as I can, but when I can't, I'm not going to live there. I'm not going to be involved so much with that. But did you feel the spirit here? Oh, Lord, my heart is not proud. Now, what does pride have to do with hope? You can't have hope if you're proud. Humility is required to have hope. Because you you see, if you think, hey, I can do it. If you think, yeah, I've got a mess here, but I'm going to fix it somehow, and I'm going to make it right. Now, there's nothing wrong with being aware of your difficult situations and trying to do something about it, okay? We got to do that. I mean, that's reality. But it's the point where we try to do something and we we think, but but it's this this arrogance that says, yes, I've got a difficult situation and God, I really don't need you because I can handle this. God, I I really don't need you because after all, I I have a master's degree in business and I know how to fix this. I have, uh, I've read the books on counseling, Lord, and I know my marriage is kind of weird and not too good, but, you know, I, I, I can fix it. I, I really don't need you. Yeah, I know my kids are really, really disruptive, and there's all kinds of problems there, but, you know, I, I've read the books. I, I, I can handle this. No, God says there needs to be humility. Yes, work, you get the degrees, read the books, do all those things, but bottom line, don't have a spirit of, I can handle this, God. Have a spirit that says, oh, Lord, my heart is not proud. And he gives us another picture for what this looks like. And I love this picture. Look at it. Verse, verse 2. Surely I have composed or calmed. I have composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rest against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. A weaned child, two and a half, three-year-old child is what he's talking about. 
You've seen it. Little three-year-old maybe stubs his toe or she has a toy taken away from her by a four-year-old brother or whatever it might be. And that little child just burst into tears. I mean, it's the most tragic thing that ever happened in the world. Running, not to the granddad, okay? Bypasses me altogether, goes to mama. Wants to be in mama's arms, wants to be held by mama. That's the picture here that we run to God and say, God, I'm hopeless. I need help. God, I need you. And that hopelessness may be something as major as your marriage is falling apart or you've got suicidal thoughts or whatever it might be. You're feeling terribly hopeless. God wants you to run to him. Or it might be something as simple as, God, I really am struggling with how I'm going to handle Thanksgiving and I I need help here. Either way, see that little three-year-old, whether it's a a broken ankle or a stubbed toe. That little three-year-old wants to be held by mama because that three-year-old at that point in time desperately needs mama. Some of us that don't have hope, it's not an issue of being hopeless. It's an issue of being arrogant. We're too proud to say, God, I need you. But oh, my friends, that's what he wants us to say. He wants to hold us. He wants to help us. He wants to be in our lives. He wants us to hope in him for that daily work, just like we hope in him for that eternal work. What is God going to do? Who knows? But we know he's going to do something. And we know it's going to be good, even though it may be hard. It's going to be good. So God comes to us today and says, put your hope in me for those big things that you struggle with. Yes, and some of us this morning, oh, oh, how could I possibly know your struggles? I can't, but I do know that you're people that live in this world. Some of us this morning are, are heartbroken over some relationship issues. Some of us this morning, are, are, you know, when we prayed for people that need to hear God's word, uh, in the beginning, well, somebody came to our mind. Every time you come here and that prayer is prayed, you pray for that person. And they're still not here. That breaks your heart. So, so th- th- these things, these areas where we need hope, they're, they're big, but they're also the little things. But God says, I want you to trust in me. I want you to hope in me. <laughs> And by God's grace, some of you have. Some of you have struggled with some illnesses, but your faith has not wavered. The doctors don't know what's going on. They've tried to figure it out. They've given you some relief, but by and large, it it just doesn't look like it's going to go away. And you've remained faithful, and you keep hoping in God. Keep it up. Keep it up. Some of you have struggled with with family issues that that you've done everything you can do but just doesn't seem to be fixing and and you're fixing anything but you are faithful to God and you are still hoping in him. Keep up that hope. Keep it up. So God is encouraging some of you today saying, hey, keep going, man. Good stuff. There's some of us that God is stepping into our lives saying, hey, Yeah, you're eternally hoping in me. That's good. For your forgiveness, yeah, amen. Sure glad you've done that, yeah. And and yeah, I've got a place in heaven for you and I'm going to redeem you. Yeah, good, good belief, good hope. But now would you start hoping in me in your business? Would you start hoping in me on a daily basis in the way that you raise your family? Would you start hoping in me when it comes to your involvement in in, in Faith Bible Church or whatever church God may have you in? Would would you start truly hoping in me and start doing what I want you to do? Yes, crawl up in my lap. And yes, I want to comfort you. But God, there's also some things that you need to do. It's kind of interesting. Last week, uh, the passage that Rick preached on, it's the peace that God wants to give us. The Lord of peace grants you peace. Sometimes you crawl up into God's lap and he just said, yeah, just sit here for a while. Let me comfort you. Let me calm your spirit. Let me hold you. Let me say that I love you and just give you that security of, oh God, I so need you. Sometimes that's what a mother does with a little three-year-old. 
But after that calmness comes, what does that mother do? She said, now, you need to go back out there and... You see, there's a passive part to hope, but there's also an active part. What's God want you to do? He's doing his part, but he also gives you responsibility. (laughs) But we say, God, I can't do that. God, I can't do that because of this, this, and this. Well, that's, no, he wants you to hope in him. He wants to do it through you. He wants to empower you. It's, it's an issue of hoping him, of, of hoping in him and not hoping in yourself. You, there's no way I can fix my marriage. There's no way I can fix my job. There's no way I can fix this relational situation. I've done everything I can do. And God says, good, keep working at it, but hope in me, I'm going to do something that you can't see. So you follow me. You hope in me. And all my friends, please, please hear this. As I say, please hear this as if I didn't want you to hear anything else. Well, of course I want you to hear everything else. But, but this is, this is this about this eternal stuff that we talked about. This is, this is really life and death, what I'm about to talk about right now. Everyone in this room is going to die someday. We will. I'm closer to it than I ever have been. Turned 70 last week or a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I'm going to die. So are you. Do you have that eternal hope of forgiveness? You can have that today. You can have that promise, that hope of eternal life. How do you get it? Well, just like we talked about here, it's an issue of pride. Who are you trusting to get that? Yourself? Some organization? No, you can't do it. That's the problem. All those marks, that's the problem. You're going to have more and more marks but there's forgiveness in Jesus. You need to put your hope completely and solely in him and what he has done for you. Oh, my friends, if you haven't done that, please, please do that today. Make a decision right now that you are trusting Christ as your, the one that gives you forgiveness, as your savior, we say. Savior from sin. Put your trust in him. Make that decision and and then follow through with that. Tell somebody about it. Get some help. Don't be arrogant and say, well, I can do this all by myself. No, you can't. None of us can. God wants to help. God wants to give you hope. So let me just finish that up by following through. Tell somebody that you've trusted in Christ. After the service, some elders, some pastors are standing down here. Come down and just say, hey, I want you to know I I put my trust in Christ. That would kind of solidify the decision. We want you to do that. But then get plugged into a church. Get plugged into fellow believers that will help you grow, that will give you and increase your hope in what God is doing. It's the active part of hope. Well, my friends, do you hear what God is saying? I just love this. Oh, Israel, (laughs) oh, Calvin, hope in the Lord. From this time forth, that's the, the daily, from this time forth, right now, and forever, that's the eternal. Let your eternal hope affect your daily now, just a second, I'm going to pray. And after I pray, the band's going to come back up. Jamie's going to be leading us in a new hymn, a new song, written by a, a Getty organization, some people that are doing, doing some really wonderful things with worship and new music and such like that. But it's a song that is from Psalm 130. In fact, that's the kind of the title of it when you look it up, Psalm 130. And it's putting into song exactly what we've been looking at this morning. So we're going to learn that song. Jamie's going to teach us the chorus kind of thing and then teach it to us. And we're going to end the service by singing, in a sense, back to God what he has been saying to us.